order. You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man. Sammy Woodhouse was 14 when she was sexually abused by one of the men from the Rotherham notorious paedophile gangs. She says Ashid Hussein coerced her into a relationship and then crimes like robbery and drug dealing before she had his child at the age of just 15. Now she's campaigning for a law to make sure children are not charged for offences they committed at the hands of abusers. And she's written a book about her ordeal, Just a Child. It begins with what seems to be a normal teenage romance. Cathy Newman asks why she'd written it. I'm glad actually that it comes across that way because I wanted the reader to go on that journey with me and I wanted that reader, you know, to, to put themselves back to when they were 14. And I always say that grooming is the most perfect crime because it's silent and you don't even realise it's happening. So, um, you know, when I met him, he came to me as my Prince Charming. He didn't come to me as that monster. And, um, you know, he was lovely, was charming, paid me lots of compliments. He was a very nice person to begin with. Um, you know, and that's the, the person that I suppose I fell in love with. What really struck me is that time and again, you broke off with him, you returned to him, and a lot of people might find that quite hard to understand, given that he was, you know, a violently abusive man, and you were a child. Yeah. Um, and I, you were a child from a loving, stable home. Yeah, I was, yeah. Um, I remember having this constant feeling. Um, you know, of hurt and pain, and I always knew it was from him, but I felt so emotionally attached to him. And I knew I needed to get away, I just couldn't quite manage, you know, how to do it, and I suppose I have the strength to do it. And, you know, I felt like I weren't just going up against him, I was going to up against other people as well. And a lot of the, the time what he used to say to me is, well, uh, you know, if I can't have you, no one will, and I'll kill you, and then I'll go for your family as well. So, um, you know, he always used to threaten me and, I suppose, be more violent to keep me there. I screamed and screamed because I honestly thought he was going to drive the car right over the edge. There was no space or time to stop and I could see the hull of Rotherham below and the road running out. Ash, stop, please! I screwed up my eyes and put my arms across my bump to protect the baby. A moment later, Ash slammed his foot on the brakes really hard and the car stopped with the front tyre just inches from the edge of the cliff. I got out of the car and threw up all over the wheel on the passenger side and then I collapsed to the ground. Ash got out really calmly, picked me up and stood me on the edge of the cliff. I'm afraid of heights at the best of times and I was so frightened I wet myself. Ash burst out laughing. Somewhere around 1,500 children in Rotherham have, it's suspected, have been groomed between, I think, 97 and 2013. Do you think it's still going on there? Yeah, of course it is. People think that because we're now talking about it that it's all of a sudden going to stop. Um, you know, the abuse will continue. I think we now know what we're looking for. Well, what more needs to be done by government? Everything. Um, <laughs> the, the entire system isn't fit for purpose. And if it was, you know, this wouldn't still be happening as, as bad as what it is. Well, what in particular? Give me some examples. I'd like to see more funding into support services. Uh, my first campaign actually was for um, funding for counselling because I was on a six month waiting list. Now, when you are suicidal with mental health issues, which most people are when they've been abused, you know, they don't have six and 12 months to, to wait for to be seen. Through my tears, I saw a bus coming down the road. I stepped out into the middle of the road and stood there, sobbing. As I did so, I put my hand on my stomach. Sorry, I said, and then I waited for the bus to hit me. Was that your lowest moment? I think my lowest point was later on when I started to realise that I was actually a victim of grooming and um, I felt like I was just in this black hole and I could never get out of it. I blame myself. Um, I felt really guilty, you know, for everything that my family had gone through, what my son had gone through. I thought it was my fault and I just remember feeling really dirty and disgusting and, um, you know, I was wrong to feel that because the shame and the guilt's not mine to carry, it's his, but unfortunately I did feel that. When you look at your son, James, who is the son of your abuser, is that a constant reminder of what you went through? 
I don't see him as his son, I see him as my son. Um, you know, and I have constant reminders, you know, regardless of, of my son. But, um, you know, my son's my baby, he's, he's my pride and joy, so, um, you know, he's, 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 that's, it's just never bothered me, really. I can't turn back the clock and change the course of my life. If I could, I'd tell the trusting little girl I was, he's not your boyfriend. This is not love and it is abuse. He's a paedophile who is grooming and abusing you and being allowed to do so by the very agencies that are here to protect you. This is not normal or okay. This is grooming at its finest. You're not a slag, a criminal, his equal, his girlfriend or his mistress. You're just a child. You're a victim and you are not to blame. Sammy Woodhouse talking to Kathy Newman. Now, now, Sammy Woodhouse had a happy, normal childhood until one day when she was 14, she met Arshid, known as Mad Ash Hussein, and all that changed forever. Sammy was groomed by him, raped multiple times and coerced into committing violent crimes over their two-year involvement. Even uh, her, putting, her parents putting her into foster care couldn't break the hold he had on her. Sammy then had the bravery to speak out about her experiences, including on this programme. And Sh Sammy sharing her story has led to two police operations, four court cases, 22 other survivors coming forward to give evidence in those trials and an independent report finding that between 1997 and 2013, 1,400 children had also been sexually exploited in Rotherham. Well, Sammy is here now with me in the studio. First of all, thank you so much for coming in to talk to us again on this programme. Can you take me back to what your life was like before you met Ash? Yeah, I, um, I remember I had lots of good memories, um, you know, as a child. I was, um, you know, very bubbly, confident, I had lots of friends, I loved dancing. So from the age of four to 12, I'd compete around the country, uh, you know, trying to win lots of little gold medals. And, and that's what I always thought I'd, I'd be when I was older, you know, the world's greatest dancer. But um, I loved going to school, I was good at school as well. So um, there was nothing really that vulnerable about me apart from the obvious and that was that I was just a child. What changed? I, um, I was no longer dancing, so um, I started hanging about on the streets, just with, you know, my friends, people my own age, and I started going up to my local shops and, um, and that's when everything started to go downhill. Uh, especially when I was 14, I was uh, on my local shop with a friend and Arsha had the same pulled up um, in the car and started talking to my friend and my friend already knew him so he didn't feel like a complete stranger and I knew his brother a little bit as well so I thought oh, you know it'll be fine and uh, when he, he said to us oh, do you want to go for a spin I had no idea that that moment was going to change my life forever. Uh, he had a nice car, uh, he took you out at first he said all that money came from the family business, property mm. business. When did you first realise that he was involved in drugs and robberies, other crime? Um, quite, quite early on really, um, you know, so I kind of started picking up on little things and then as time went on, um, you know, I started to, to kind of pick up on the, on the bigger things like such as the robberies and stuff. Uh, which he started to get me involved with, which was great for him because it, it meant that I was getting a criminal record and it could prevent me from coming forward. When you say you got involved, what did you do? Um, lots of things, but he was taking me to armed robberies um, when he was also robbing drug dealers' homes. He also learnt me how to drive a car, so I was actually driving a vehicle on the road at just 14 years old. What was going through your mind when you, when you were doing that? Well, at the time, I didn't think about consequences because as a child, you don't. Uh, you know, when I look back now and I think, God, that's just so stupid and, and dangerous. I could have killed myself. I could have killed somebody else. But at the time, I just thought, it's fine. I shall fix it. So you were getting in trouble. How were your parents responding at the time? What were they doing? Um, very early on, my parents found out uh, within a few days and they reported it to the police and they kept doing that um, into social services. And um, What did they say? They said that I was basically making a lifestyle choice. Now, at first they said that because I wasn't willing to make a statement that there was nothing uh, that they could do. And at the time, you know, I didn't want to make a statement because I was, um, you know, a child, thought I was having a good time. I thought it was quite cool to have an older boyfriend and I couldn't see the harm in it. But when I got to 16 years old, um, he, um, he attacked me and my son. And um, I knew at that moment I have to go on record and tell the police what happened. And unfortunately, I was ignored. When you say you were ignored, what happened? How did they respond when you went to them? 
Well, um, on one incident, my abuser got me by me through and um, hung me over the top floor balcony in Rodham Town Centre. And then he kicked my son's pushchair over while my son was inside it. And he was only a few months old. But um, So I made a statement and the police officer said, well, what do you expect? He's got every right to because you stopped him from seeing his son. Um, I even went to court and got a court order because the police didn't want to act. Um, and then that's when all the intimidation started against me and my family because he was trying to keep me quiet because I was now talking. What did he do? Um, he smashed my mum's car up. He had someone parked outside my flat just about, you know, every moment. And um, you know, even started targeting my sisters, my nan -an. Um So it got to the point where me and my family just had to kind of, you know, move away. Um, I didn't keep in contact with many people. So I was always trying to find out information about where I was. Um, so I pretty much just had to hide myself away, really. Before this, I know the police raided Ash's house when you were 14 and found you in bed with him. Yeah. Uh, then you got arrested for having a weapon in your possession, in your yeah. handbag. How does that make you feel looking back on that now? Well, it, was, it wasn't actually his home. It was um, a woman was helping him, so it was in her home. But yeah, I was found half naked in bed with him. And to look back, you know, why wasn't he arrested? That, that was a moment that things could have been stopped and to arrest me as a child for carrying a weapon that he gave me. Um, and that still today is on my criminal record, so it's preventing me, you know, not just for applying for jobs, etc. But um, I feel blamed. And, you know, even though he's in prison for everything that he's done, still to this day he's, he's you know, got away with certain things. So the police found you in bed at 14 with a man who was how old at that time? Well, it was just after uh, my 15th birthday, so I just turned 15 and he was 25 at he that was, point. He was 25. Did they ask you how old you were? How old um, he was? Yeah, they, they know um, all the details. I was very well known to authorities uh, because, you know, my mum were reporting it. He was very well known um, to all the authorities as well. So they, they knew the situation. But I was never treated as a victim. How I was viewed was that I was his mistress, his, his girlfriend, and somebody that was a part of his gang rather than a victim to it. You thought this was normal? at yeah. the time. That's just what it was like to be in a relationship. Mm. When Lisa, your sister, first mentioned the word grooming, what went through your mind? Well, at this point, I think I was about 27 years old, um, and I didn't know what it was. I'd, you know, I'd never heard of it, and uh, I'd, I kind of just closed the conversation down. What did she say to you? She says, I want you to just shut up and listen to what I've got to say. Um, and she said, what happened to you? It's not normal. You weren't your boyfriend. Uh, you weren't the only person. You did it to other people as well. And I want you to come forward uh, and tell, tell someone what's happened. And it turns out that the 18 other girls thought he was their boyfriend? Um, in total, linked to him and his brothers, um, I think it's about 54. In total? Yeah. And they were underage? Yeah. You were raped by Ash. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, how, how have you turned your life around since then? Because, you know, her pretty horrific things have happened to you, but you've mm. used that and turned that into po to a positive by yeah. campaigning. Yeah. I mean, um, I think two things of what have really helped me, and the first is the support that I've had. And I know my story shows a lot of negative uh, things towards professionals, but this time round, I actually got a really good team. It was the Operation Clover team. And uh, we worked together, really, and they really supported me. So that support has helped me change things around. But as well with my campaigning, um, for me, it's been like therapy. You know, I constantly speak out about what's happened. And the fact that not only has it helped me, but I know it helps other people. Um, you know, that's, that's kind of been a, re a real part of my journey. And you spoke out many times and you were knocked back many times. You spoke to the authorities, mm. you spoke to the police, you spoke to social services, and you were knocked back every time. Do you not feel bitter about what happened? Um, I carried hate and anger for a long time um, and I just had to let that go. I mean, now I, I actually um, go in and, and help in training with police officers and social workers. And if you would have said to me five years ago, you know, Sam, in five years you're going to be sat in, in a room full of, of police officers, I would have said no chance because I had the view of everybody was corrupt. And I know now that, yeah, they are a lot of bad people, but there's also a lot of good people as well. What would you say was the worst point, the lowest point for you? Um, I think the lowest point is when I got diagnosed with my major depression um, and I was really suicidal and I, I've tried many times in my life to kill myself but the fact that my children witnessed that um, so it's been really difficult for them as well so yeah I think that was probably my lowest. You lost your mum, I know yeah. that. What's your relationship like with your father now? 
Um, to be honest, I don't see my family um, that often, but um, they have been in contact and they've said, you know, we're supporting, we're really proud here. Um, yeah, I probably should see my family that little bit more. But, um, yeah, it's, it's good to know that, you know, the, the supporting it as well. You know, it's affected my family so much. It, it completely ripped my family apart. And in the book, I wanted to show just how much it affects families. And when I look back and I think, you know, I did have that family that was strong and supporting me and, and trying to help me and look at everything that, that still went on. You know, what about those, those little girls and boys that were in care homes that didn't have those families? You know, always there for them. Miss Sammy, the book's really honest. I've read it. A mm. And you admit at the beginning when you first met Ash, you lied about your age. Yeah. Um, very honest. I mean, d how much do you still blame yourself? Because you talk about that in the book. Yeah. Um, I blame myself for, for a long time, but I don't blame myself anymore because, you know, the, the guilt, the blame and the shame, it's not mine to carry, it's his. I was a child, um, you know, and he took advantage of that. And South Yorkshire Police um, have told us the forces has and continues to make significant improvement in tackling criminality mm. associated with child sexual exploitation and safeguarding potential victims. They work closely with partner agencies to safeguard and protect young people and they now have better processes in place to deal with reports of criminality and to support victims. Mm. I know you're working with them now yeah. to try and change things. Um, what, what else needs to happen? What needs to change? I think since, um, you know, everything happened in Rotherham, um, we have took a, a major U-turn, you know, with the council and the police, and um, things have improved so much. And not only did, um, you know, things change in Rotherham, but I think what happened in Rotherham apps, um, you know, highlighted everything around the UK. But I think that um, agencies are very much under-resourced and understaffed. And I think the government need to be put in, um, you know, a lot more police officers, um, you know, some better training involved in. But some of it, you know, it's just down to common sense and just being, you know, a decent human being. And what I always say to professionals, no matter what job you're in, is when you're dealing with a victim, treat them how you'd expect your own child to be treated. I mean, do you realise the impact? Does it, does it really sink in of the fact that you speaking out has resulted in, you know, the biggest abuse investigation in history in this country, four mm. trials, criminals being sentenced in nearly 300 years, yeah. you know, in, in prison? Yeah. I think, um, you know, from, from the day I spoke out, everything's just been so crazy and, um, you know, it's every day I'm doing interviews, I'm in training and stuff, so I don't think I've ever had a proper chance just to sit down and, and take take it all in. Um, it, it's kind of just been so wild. But um, I am proud of myself, you know, and, you know, not just myself that's been speaking out. There's a lot of survivors out there. And, um, you know, I, I hope that they're proud of the, themselves as well. You know, together we've, we've changed the country and, and changed a lot of things, actually. Being in the public eye and speaking out and on different media platforms, speaking mm. to newspapers, has there been any negativity towards you? There has, but it's been very small, and I expected some of it, but, um, yeah, majority have, um, you know, it's been really positive, and I think that's been one of the hardest things, actually, you know, speaking out is how do I deal with, um, you know, some people being really negative. But um, I try to ignore it. It's, it's hard at times to do that. But I just try and rise above it and just remember, well, actually, what I'm doing is helping people. And, and that's, you know, what I'm here to do. How do you feel about Ash now? I don't feel anything towards him. And I felt many things. Um, you know, I hated him. I felt angry. And... Um, it made me a very bitter and angry person. And I knew that I just had to let that go and forgive him. And there's a lot of people that um, find that really hard to believe that I, you know, I forgive a man that's caused me so much pain. But, you know, for me, continuing to, to have those feelings and that anger, he's, he's still controlling me and I'm still his victim. As far as I'm concerned, I've moved forward. Um, you know, I've got justice. There'll be things that stay with me for the rest of my life. But um, it's up to me to, to try and have, you know, a, a decent life if I can. And uh, you've, you've written a book about your experiences, Just a Child, yes. which is out now. Sammy, thank you so much for coming in to speak to us this morning.